The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Well, confession is uh, really good for the soul, but uh, let me just tell you very transparently, it's really hard for pastors. Often we hear confessions from parishioners, but seldom do we give confessions to our church. But I've been feeling in my heart for some time the need to give a confession. It was something that was building and building in my heart and mind for a long time. And I still remember the day, that very defining moment in my life and my congregation, when I expressed my failure to my congregation. We had invited a national speaker whose name all of you would know to come to Christ's community, the church I have served, the wonderful church I have served for 28 years in Kansas City. And the room was packed. You can imagine my excitement to introduce someone that I looked up to in amazing ways. And his message to our congregation and many in our city was the church's mission in the world. So I was filled with excitement as I was ready to introduce him. I was sitting next to him, uh, and I realized that at that moment was the moment that the Holy Spirit had called me to come clean with my congregation. And so before I introduced him, as the congregation was filled with expectation and joy and electricity in the room, as I walked up to the podium, it became quiet, quiet with expectations. But I realized as I was about to share what my heart told me I needed to share, that it moved from quiet to pin drop silence. I stood before my congregation and I said, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I need to communicate to you something that is on my heart, something that I need to communicate in a way that expresses to you my deep remorse and failure. And I explained to them it wasn't a failure of financial malfeasance or moral impropriety, but it was a compelling failure to them. And that was pastoral malpractice. See, in my past, up to that point in almost a decade of pastoral ministry, I had spent the majority of my time equipping them for the minority of their life. And it came because I became aware, became aware of an impoverished theology. My impoverished theology profoundly impoverished my pastoral vocational paradigm and profoundly impoverished my pastoral praxis. And the greatest sadness is it profoundly impoverished the congregation I served. So I did it. I expressed my failure And my congregation has responded to that failure. That defining moment was a transforming moment in my life and in my congregation. In almost two decades, we have seen profound transformation in our pastoral staff and in our congregation. Our pastoral staff have become more effective, focusing on the majority of people's life. Because many of us were focused on people coming to our place of work on Sunday and not for us going to their place of work on Monday. Many of us had focused on the minority of life rather than the majority of life. And most of us had a profound and God-dishonoring Sunday to Monday gap in our thinking and praxis. Since that time, in almost two decades of pastoral work in a wonderful congregation in Kansas City, we've seen a remarkable transformation in people's lives, not only in the staff, but the individual congregants. Today, increasingly, congregants see the primary place of worship for them is not Sunday morning, it is Monday morning. They also understand that the primary spiritual formation of their lives does not take place on Sunday morning or in a Bible study, as important as that is, during the week. That the primary spiritual formation takes place in the workplace every day where they are growing in Christ-likeness. 
But not only that, they are transformed in understanding their gospel mission as Monday. Not only the gospel mission of incarnating the gospel in and through their life, but a remarkable place for gospel proclamation. And they also begin to understand increasingly that to love their neighbor as themselves involves what they do in their work on Monday. Our congregation has been transformed because now they have a biblical definition of work, and that is that work is not fundamentally compensation, it is profoundly contribution. So from cradle to grave, our entire congregation is on a God-glorifying mission in and through the work they've been called to do. I am so grateful that God did not give up on me as a failing pastor, nor did my church give up on me, nor did God give up on the local church I serve, nor has God given up on the local church in our nation and our world. I know from many followers of Jesus that the church experience can be less than optimum, right? Many of us have experienced hurt and disappointment and disillusionment, not only with the church, but also many pastors. And I am sorry about that. But I want to suggest to you, with the deepest heart passion I can muster this morning, that when it comes to the mission of God in the world, the local church is not optional. It is essential. And if we have an impoverished understanding of the local church, we will have an impoverished understanding of the mission of God in the world. And what we are facing as a faith, work, and economic movement is an opportunity to move the local church where it should be, and that is at the very heart of God, the very mind of Christ, and to the very center of our movement. I believe this with all my heart and all my mind. And I believe the local church needs to be at the very heart of your life as well. Whether you are a congregant leader, whether you are a parachurch leader, whether you are a pastor, that the local church must be at the center of your life for your flourishing and the flourishing of the world. I believe this for three compelling reasons, and I'd like to share them with you. The local church is Jesus' idea, and what we see throughout history and scripture is the local church is uniquely designed by Jesus, it's strategically positioned by Jesus, and it's greatly loved by Jesus. First, I want to highlight the local church is uniquely designed by Jesus. We are introduced to the church in Matthew chapter 18, and Jesus says that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus understood that this word ekklesia in the original Greek is a word that he plucked from the Roman Empire to describe two dynamics in its etymology. One is this word has a sense of the called out ones. It has plurality and locality. In other words, when Jesus described his plan of redemption, he centered it in locality and plurality. And what we begin to understand is his disciples understood Jesus' words to build his church. Yes, there is a big C, and that's important. That's believers of all time and all places, the church triumphant and invisible. But Jesus' primary focus is not the big C, it's the little C. Jesus has some massively big thinking about the little C. And you and I need to embrace that. When the disciples heard Jesus say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, they understood his words, his mission and redemption, not primarily through the lens of individual transformation, but the establishment of communities, new creation communities throughout the Roman Empire. We see this in the Great Commission when Jesus said to make all disciples of all nations. And sure enough, what happens in the book of Acts, it's not just individual conversion, it's the multiplication of redemptive communities throughout the Roman Empire. Jesus' focus for the world was the multiplication of local redemptive communities called the Little C. Jesus uniquely designed the local C to do what it can only do. It is plan A, there is no plan B. What I want to suggest to you for your thinking and your heart is that Jesus uniquely designed two institutions for human flourishing. He designed the family and marriage in creation. He designed the local church in redemption. And without those two, humans do not flourish, nor does the gospel have its impact in the world. Most of us would never give up on the family and marriage, even though it's difficult, even though it's disappointing, and yet many of us are ready to give up on the local church. The local church can be disappointing, it can be disillusioning, but it can never be disposable. It is at the heart of God's design. 
God designed the local church to do what it can only do in the world. It's uniquely designed by Jesus. But secondly, it's strategically positioned by Jesus. Imagine if you had a product that would allow humans to flourish from cradle to grave, and you wanted to get that product out to the world, and what you would need would be a distribution system, a massive distribution system throughout the globe. And you had this product, and imagine you just put outside your door of your house or your apartment a kiosk saying, this is the product, here it is, world. How smart and strategic would that be? Not very smart. Might be well-intentioned, but it wouldn't be very smart. Because a distribution system needs to be in place for our message to go forth throughout our nation and the world. Now, when we look at distribution systems in America and around the world, let's just take Walmart. Let's take Target. Let's take Amazon or Costco or whatever you want to say. Just for example, Walmart and Target. Today, research tells us there are 5,000 Walmarts in the United States, let alone the massive number around the globe. Also Targets, that's at 1,800 currently in the United States. That's 6,800 if my math is right. And imagine that you had this product and you ignored these distribution systems. How wise would that be? And yet, many of us miss the massive distribution system that God has already put in place in every nook and cranny of society, urban, rural, and, and suburban, and city, in every corner of our nation. Do you know that in current research of churches in America, just America, there are 300,000 Protestant local churches, 300,000, 25,000 local Catholic parishes. That's phenomenal. And you say, yeah, some of them are dying, some of them are withering, some are very good distribution systems. I'll grant you that. But one of the untold stories of our time is the thriving growth of local churches in every nook and cranny of our society. It is absolutely stunning. Lifeway research tells us at Stetzer that 4,000 churches are planted every year in America. So this distribution has an amazing way to recorrect itself and focus on the culture. It is a massive opportunity for us. And many of us are missing this. Cultural observers are telling us this. Raj Chetty, an economist at Harvard in the Wall Street Journal, looked at our culture, said the two keys to renewal are twofold. One is the renewal of local schools that are effective. Secondly, Raj Chetty, an economist at Harvard, said, I don't know his worldview, said local faith communities are vital for cultural renewal. Why is it that cultural observers see what many Christians do not see? The local church is the distribution system. Jesus has placed it 2,000 years. It has gone through all kinds of ups and downs, and it is more vibrant today around the globe than ever before. The local church is uniquely designed by Jesus. It's strategically positioned by Jesus like nothing else. The local church really, really matters. But it not only really, really matters because it's uniquely designed to do only what it can do. It is plan A. It is strategically positioned like nothing else. It really matters. The third reality that grabs my heart, and I hope it grabs yours, yes, it's uniquely designed. It's strategically positioned, the little c, but it's greatly loved by Jesus. One of the primary metaphors in the New Testament is the bride. And theologian Mirzoth Wolf, Craig Van Gelder, tell us that the primary focus of the, of the New Testament is the local church, the little c. The bride of Christ is not just some massive C, big C, it is the little C. And one of the things I just so love when I'm a pastor is I have the privilege of doing weddings and officiating at weddings. And one of my favorite moments is when I'm standing here and the groom is standing next to me and the bride is coming down the aisle. All eyes are on the bride. And I look over at the groom right next to me and his heart is almost pounding out of his chest. There's nothing else in the world that matters more than the groom looking at the bride. It's the love of his heart. There's nothing else that matters more. Jesus gives us this metaphor that the local church is the bride of Christ. It is not a secret or a mystery what Jesus loves most. What does Jesus love most? He loves his church most. And when you follow Jesus and walk close to him, you love increasingly what he loves. St. Augustine said the greatest definition of sin 
is disordered loves. Do you love what Jesus loves? The closer you walk with Jesus, the more you love what he loves. To love Jesus and not to love his local church is incoherent. The more you love him, the more you'll love his church. Yes, warts and all. Local church is loved by Jesus more than anything else on this planet. The question is, do you love her like that? I had a conversation with a parishioner not long ago, a brilliant CEO in my congregation. And he said this question. He said, Tom, if I, and he listed this massive amount of money, if I gave this amount of money to Christ's community, what would Christ's community do with it? And I looked at him and I said, the problem is not the large size of your gift, my friend. It's the small size of your vision of a local church. This parishioner, this brilliant CEO, who embraces our movement, has not only a conversion to Jesus, but he has a conversion to the local church. Because he is seeing that the local church is uniquely designed to do what it can only do. It is strategically positioned like nothing else in the world. And it's the most loved by Jesus. And he is aligning his life, his heart, his investment, his time, his talent. He's not just an attender of a church. He's all in in the church and the mission. See, confession is not only good for the soul. It's not only good for pastors. I want to suggest it's good for you too. Because pastors do need to confess. We do need repentance. But we also need congregation members and leaders to make their own confession. Perhaps you need to confess that you have not had a rich theology that places the local church at the heart. Perhaps you need to confess that you have not seen the local church as a strategic centerpiece of your life and ministry and your work. And perhaps you've not loved the local church as Jesus loves it. The local church really, really matters. And Jesus said, the local church really, really, really matters to me. And the question is, does the local church really, really matter to you? Thank you.